Right, so for today's technical sort of video, I'm gonna talk about pretty much the, the most common feature that we're faced or we, we have to fish on, I wanna say 90% of pegs. You know what I mean? It's very, very rare you're gonna draw a peg, particularly on a commercial fishery, whether it be a snake lake or open water, where you are not somewhere in your peg gonna have a slope to target. I mean, massively, massively popular areas, fish holding areas in so many pegs that whether it's winter, summer, whatever, these areas are vital that it's, it's where the fish feed. I mean, it's where they want to be, where you're gonna get a nice hard bottom, it's where the fish live. So it's imperative that we understand how to target them correctly. And it's been massive for me, both in my F1 fishing and my silverfish fishing this winter, just understanding the slopes that you have in your peg and the options it gives you. I see a big, big mistake very, very often is people not targeting the right areas of the peg or enough areas of the peg within a slope and it's definitely somewhere that can be improved upon. So that is what I'm gonna do for you lot today, is just show you exactly how I go about targeting them. Slightly tricky, really steep inclines on lots of the commercials that we have. Right, so onto the technical bit, and we've come today, the perfect sort of situation for me is on a snake lake, and we came to the canal at Isaac Walton, which is notoriously steep on the far bank. I mean, perfect example for sort of targeting the quite extreme incline sort of thing that can be quite tricky to work out where you need to fish. I mean, we've had a plumb up already. This is perfect, pretty much for what I want to show you. And I want to go through the steps in just making sure every area is covered. So like I say, we're targeting the far bank slope. So first things, get my goggles on because I can't see a flipping thing. And before I go into types of rigs and all the, the little important things, it's finding the bottom of the slope is always the first step. The first thing I want to establish is how close to that far bank the bottom of the slope is, because that'll dictate, in most situations, the gradient of the slope, depending on how much it comes up, obviously. So that's going to be my first step now. Is obviously, we've already done it, just so I'm not wasting your lot's time. And I found, in today's case, that probably what? I'm going to say a metre. A metre short of that far bank. Around here, you can see I'm at full depth here, pretty much. Yeah, so I'm well off here. I mean, a whole section away there, and I can keep on going. But the most important thing is keeping that line straight, so I'm nice and slow. So it's left me plummet off, push me rig across another six, eight inches, drop it down until it starts to come up. So I'm nearly all the way to the end of me. Yeah, there I can feel it. So all of a sudden, I'm touching the, far, the, the slope. So right at the end of me, 11 meter section stays. Okay, see, it's, it's at an angle now that I know that that's touching the far bank slope. You can just feel it's just completely different. So I know that if I sit on my 11 meter section there, in today's case, that's the bottom of my slope before I reach a really, really steep bit of a cliff like in incline if you want, then I'm gonna show you just how steep it is. And look at it from this angle, I'm gonna say a bit less than a meter, a little bit shorter of a meter I'm getting there between the bottom of the slope and the far bank, which is pretty much perfect for me. I mean, I'd like it to be a little bit less of an incline, but that deep water close to the far bank, it's great for giving me different options that the fish are happily to move in and very, very likely to move in. So this is my first rig. In today's case, because I've got what? I've got four and a bit foot, four and a half foot nearly. I've gone with a fairly decent float on that. I think I've gone with a 0.5 on that. So it gives myself plenty of shot to get it down to so the type of shot and all that. I'll touch on it in a minute, but that's very much dictated to how you have it shot at size of floats with what bait you're gonna use. So today's case, it's maggots. So it's all about stringing things out, keeping things nice. So yeah, I'm happy with that. That's the bottom of my slope. Pretty much uniform there, wherever I put it. More than happy to have that as my first rig. And that's often the one I'm gonna plumb up first is get me deep one covered, say to establish where the bottom of the slope is. But then what I can do once I've done that it's just lift my rig nice and vertical. I don't want to push it right into that far bank vegetation, but I just want to see what that far bank's doing. So you can see I'm on the bottom there. Another six, eight inches, and I'm nearly at half depth of what I've got. So I can see it really is coming up, but I can feel it's a right steep incline, but I can work with that, so it's all good. So next, what I'm going to do, I'm going to whiz him back. What I will do quickly that I haven't done is I'll mark that with a bit of tape, but I'll do that in a second once I've gone through the depth of my rigs, because there's something else I want to show you with marking with tape. And next, I'm going to go to the far bank, my shallowest rig. Yeah, I've got him ready. He's good to go. And what I'm looking for is the shallowest possible water in my peg is the next step. And then I can work out whether there's enough between them 
and whether the incline allows for me to stick another rig in between them, which I deal. So the more rigs, the merrier. I'm perfectly happy to set for up to four rigs, potentially at different depths. Because the more I can set up, or the more different depths I can find, the more options I've got of catching fish. So you can see with this one, this is my really shallowest water one, and touching the bank, right in the very, very shallowest bit, even that's a bit of a slope, but that's what I've got there. Touching the bank, I can't go any further, I mean, without getting snagged up on on a bit of veg, but that's the shallowest I can get. And so the difference in them is probably what? I'm, I'm just past me join, so holding that, what are you gonna give me? Two foot? So it's not a lot at all that that depth goes from four and a half foot to two foot. So a real, 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 real steep incline, but that's found the two. I mean, this is the easiest one to find, the shallowest water that I can find. Tight on that far bank. That's gonna be me emptying it area later on. And then lastly, I'm going to find in between them, but you can see straight away on them, there's a huge difference between the two. If I hold that so you lot can see it, do you know I mean? I'm not even half depth on that shallow one. I've literally got 18 inch on that bottom one, whereas the top one, as I say, four and a half foot easy. There's a lot of difference between them in a short area across the canal. But lastly, what I want to try and do, I'm never ever going to find a flat spot. But what I'm looking for now is to find an area where my plummet sticks just slightly in between the two ideally or it doesn't even have to stick it just needs to sort of hold a little bit which is never going to be able to get any bait to settle on it but i'll explain me thinking behind it in a bit so this next one what i'm going to do is i've set it in between those two depths so i've got this one set at about three foot yeah so it's just in between the two to give myself another option and i'm going to go make sure i know where i'm sitting i'm going to drop it see how i can find it there straight away so obviously I'd already had a sneaky look at that, but that one little area there, I can get it just to hold slightly. Yeah, anywhere else I drop it, see how it just dot bobbles all the way down and falls to the bottom of the slope. So it is a really, really steep, steep incline that I'm gonna show you in a minute, but see how it's just holding there? And it works out beautifully for me, so I'm holding my join, I know exactly where it is. And what that gives me is three points. So I've got the bottom of the slope, great, loads of fish are gonna accumulate there. I've got the top of the slope when they wanna feed, and I've got on that lovely incline as well that could potentially pick me a few fish off if that's the depth they want to be in. So that's the main emphasis at this time of year and in fact all times of year, especially when catching F1s, is that they want to be in whatever depth they want to be. So if it's that they're all sat in the middle at sort of three foot, then that's the point that they're going to hit the bank and that's where they're going to feed best. If I've only got rigs set above that and below that, it's not going to be as efficient if I can get them feeding on that three foot line. Plus, even though it's a massive steep incline, so you can imagine for the fish, I've spoken about this loads and loads before, is that if it's a lovely big steep slope, like that sort of angle, the fish love it because they can go straight into it. They're not having to upend on a flat spot like they would if it were here. I mean, because it's lovely and steep and there's an odd maggot stuck to it, they can just go straight in and they can actually see what they're eating. They're not having to bend down and feed and feel for the bait. They're actually visually picking out the bait off the slope. You can make bites really, really easy to to get sort of thing because your bait's getting picked out so quickly. So I've got me three things ready. I've got me three rigs set, three different depths, or one area of the canal. And this sort of has two big benefits. Firstly, I'm covering me different depths that the fish could be in. I mean, on the day, they can definitely fluctuate between the different depths. So I've got me three different depths, the only depths that I can achieve today covered. Secondly, and what I definitely feel is once the water gets warmer and the fish start feeding, um, you're not chasing the F1s about, I mean, or any fish, whether it's F1, silvers, whatever. I'm not having to chase the fish to come into my bait. And I definitely like it specifically on snake lakes, if anything, but also up to an island. I love fishing in this way because I have one sort of stripe of bait. And I believe them fishing moving up and down the canal all the time. And because I've got one line of bait, but rigs to cover everything, I'm stopping any fish that are moving through. I mean, I've got one area that all my fish are concentrated on, be it in different depths. So I can sort of try and keep in touch with them fish, depending on what depth they want to be at, as they move through my peg, instead of having two or three different areas along the far bank like you would in winter, where you're sort of catching cagey fish. I mean, I'm not splitting my fish up, I'm keeping them in one area with lots and lots and lots of fish feeding. Hopefully, that'll all prove itself later on. So lastly, what I want to do now, I'm quickly going to take these up, and I'm going to show you exactly the sort of gradient that I'm faced with today.
So all plumbed up, all taped up as well. And just to, to be a bit weird, <laughs> just show you exactly the sort of gradients I'm faced with, I thought we'd bring them here, tape them up, put my rigs against them, and you can see just what I'm faced with here. Within that short distance of what, 18 inch? I mean, massive, massive incline. If I stick me, me landing at there, where's that float? There, that's the sort of incline I'm faced with. Yeah, you can see it's a big R gradient that, but fishable on. See, when you look at it in that respect, you can just see it's not too bad. I mean, an odd bait is still gonna stick on that. I mean, if it was like this, no chance. But that nice incline there, hold him like that. That's how he is. An odd bait is still gonna be capable of sticking on that, which is why this rig can be so good. Am I holding him in the right place? Yeah, there he is. So not too bad. This just shows what I'm fishing on. That, that slope, them fish are gonna love coming in nice and vertical, picking bait off at all different points of it, while still being happy to focus on the the main sort of feed areas, if you like, of the bottom where the bait's going to accumulate, or the top of, uh, sorry, the bottom of that way where the bait's going to accumulate in that deepest water, or maybe if they're really, really confident, really feeding a lot of competition going on, then they're going to push that bait to the top. So I'm covering myself every different option just to see where them fish want to be at different points of the session. So on to the feeding. Right, so onto the good bit, but before we're unleashed and we catch a few fish, first I want to talk about the bait choices and the type of rigs for it, isn't it? When it comes to bait choice, really, really simple, I want a bait that can potentially loose feed. So for me, that keeps things really simple, either hard pellets, maggots, or casters. I mean, it's very rarely I'll use any other bait because I want the option, I want the versatility. At this time of year, once fish are feeding, I want to get catty out. I want to feed lots of bait, be really aggressive, draw lots of fish into my peg, potentially, if the peg's allowing. So today I've gone with maggots just a little bit less selective then fish will eat more as well i mean we're only just what we are now middle of march we're not i'm telling lies we're on middle of february and um, still cold there's not a lot of fish so i'd be a little bit i'd be a bit cautious of feeding hard pellets just because fish aren't going to eat that amount of bait just yet and you're very likely going to spoil your peg with maggots however i can blast them till my heart's content and there's plenty of little mouths of various species are going to clear that bait up which is going to be perfect for this style of fishing as well so all plumbed up all ready to go so i've got me three rigs so firstly me bait the bait choice and um, that i go for on whatever day will dictate just as it would fish in open water and um, the shot in my rigs the type of floats and the shotting so as you can imagine all my rigs today because i'm going to loose feed maggots in potentially a decent depth of four and a half foot in some points of my peg i want a nice rig that's it's not going to be too heavy. It's not going to be a bulk down one. It's just going to be a nice spread shot in. In that case, I've got one of our one of our floats on in a 0.4. So I told you fibs before. I said a 0.5, put a 0.4 on. So it's still going to give me plenty of shot in. In that I've just got a nice taper of number 10s. Yeah, not too positive. Still going to give me a nice, fairly sexy fall, but it's going to get down and do the job quite quick. I mean, it's not a huge part of it. It's just keeping things right for the bait. I mean, if I was fishing hard pellets, I'd bulk that down a lot more, have a lot heavier, a lot tighter shot in. With maggots, I mean, your rigs to suit it naturally needs to be a, a bit of a slow fall in. And all the rigs pretty much the same. Yeah, I've got the same, my 0.4, a 0.3 and a 0.2 float. All shot in exactly the same way. All just with spread out tens in this case. I mean, and then your lines, hooks and all that are just suited to the fish we're gonna catch. I think today we've got a nice old 10 to our green stuff because we're gonna catch a bit of everything. So onto the fishing, I'm not gonna bore you too much with the technical bit and to start off we've got to be careful yeah i have had a little sneaky go i fed a little bit of bait so things are happening in my peg but if it were a, a match and i was going straight in then i do still need to be careful the last thing i want to do especially now with it being very much back end of winter still um, is go all gung-ho feed loads and loads of bait and upset my peg before i know what's going on so i still want to err on the side of caution and what i'm going to do is start in the deeper water to see what's happening and i'm going to feed with a pot I mean, even though I'm not going to spread any bait just to begin with, by feeding with a pot at the bottom of the slope, what am I going to feed? I'm going to feed about 15, 20 maggots. Yeah, I'm going to feed at the bottom of the slope because it's where I've got somewhere to move from. I mean, if I start right in the shallow water, very, very unlikely there's going to be fish there to begin with. Equally, if I start right on the slope with it being so steep, where am I going? There's my tape. Um, I'll leave that dolly butt on to make it nice and easy. If I were to start on the slope, there's going to be no bait there yet. And it's going to be very, very difficult for any bait to accumulate on that slope. So it's be the, 
a poor area to start sort of thing. So straight in on my deep one, plonking him in nice. I think I may have got a few too many fish in the peg already here, but you see that settles lovely. And we're into fish straight away over that bait, all nice. But what I'm gonna do very quickly, so this is gonna be a nice day, there's gonna be loads and loads of fish feeding, is get Catty out and start feeding. But when I do start feeding, I'm very, very rarely going to feed over my deep line. I mean, I don't need to. Don't like that. It fell off. But yeah, I don't need to feed over my deep line. That's naturally going to top itself up. My maggot folded over. Hate it when it does that. Do you know why? That's because I hooked it in the fat end. I've learned that. You never hook maggots in the fat end. It's always the pointy end. But for some reason, when I put one on, I always want to. Don't know. Pointy end. Yeah, best tip of the day, that. But still, let me fix him. So I'm not going to feed again because there's lots and lots of fish there. I'm going to ditch the pot immediately. I think we've attracted a lot of fish into the swim and straight away I'd get catty out. So in a match if it were tricky to begin with I would I'd stick with the pot and keep things nice and tight at the bottom of the slope until I felt there were fish starting to feed in my peg. But what I know I can do today is because there's loads of fish is I'm going to get catty out straight away but as I say I'm not going to feed many over the line I'm on now I'm going to put it all past so my baits all landing further up the slope. Yeah, so I'm actually blasting it onto the far bank nearly. A lot of bait's going onto the far bank, just dribbling down. And because of the, the severity of that slope, I know that I can, my bait's going to naturally top my bottom line up itself. It's going to trickle down that slope. Any bait that's missed, it's going to, the maximum accumulation of bait is going to occur at the bottom of the slope. But immediately, if I can get fish competing at all three depths, Yes, it might give me a few issues on liners to begin with on this deeper rig. But what it should do very, very quickly is spread fish all over the place and give me options to move about throughout my peg. See, I think this one may be not in the mouth, but still we're landing him. We're getting him in. I reckon. Where are you? These are the exact ones I want to draw loads of into my peg. And then naturally, the... the in Increase in competition, <laughs> increase in competition, will naturally push them fish up. The warmer it is, it definitely wouldn't surprise me to start actually seeing signs of fish tight against that mud. It's perfect then. Just checking we're all good. Yeah, we haven't lost anything. And we go straight back in, hooking it the right way. And see what happens. And every cast I'm going to keep on feeding now the way I've done. So I keep topping that far bank up to give myself the options as quickly as possible to drop in on the, all my pegs. I mean, it's never going to be a case of there's fish on all my lines. I mean, by judging by the indications that I get, by things that are happening, like in that case, foul looking one, if that happens again, no, that's in the gob, that's nice. Then really quickly, I'm going to be happy to move further up. That might actually be foul look this one. If it is, then that's going to be the perfect um, sign then I need to move on to my shallower rig, onto that three-footer. Let's just see if he's in the mouth or not. No, I think he's in the mouth, this one. Yeah, he's in the mouth, this one. But see, by being aggressive, now that the fish are finally coming out the, the winter sleeps and they're starting to feed, you can be so aggressive on that one line and any fish that are in the vicinity, they're not all going to be in that one area on such a, a small peg. The last thing I want to do is split them all over the place. But I've got the best of both. I mean, I've got one area, loads of competition, but all the depths that could potentially be found in this peg are covered. So there's no chance of me not having somewhere in my peg where I can do things right. I'm going to catch one more in that. And then, of course, I wouldn't bother coming off this. I'd carry on with this for a bit. But just for today, we was wanting to rush things along a bit for you lot. I'm going to try really quickly my other lines. And just see what they're doing. Same again, just keep putting that bait all on that far bank. So you see none of it's landing anywhere near me float. I mean, which, if anything, it's going to make liners happen because it's naturally trying to draw them up, which is what I want, because the shallower I can get them, the less I'm going to foul up, the quicker I'm going to catch him, and the easier it becomes. But only if they're willing to do so. It's a lovely, lovely way. And another thing I mentioned before is that you can often find, see, I'm having a few problems now. A few liners, a few missed bites. Drop this in once more. Hopefully come back with a fish. And if I don't, 
I'm immediately going to whiz back, put the next one on, put the, what are we going to call it, the middle rig, the three foot in this case, whiz that in on that really steep incline, just to show you that although it's, it feels horrible to plumb up on, there's still definitely a, a mega, mega area peg to fish on. Probably my favourite, if anything. Three little weird indications, it's actually little weird fish. It could be that them F1s have either left me peg or they've moved up because they need for competition, they move further up. And you often find that you catch the little, little weird fish, the little scavengery fish like him at the bottom. I mean, where the competition isn't happening, you can often drop and catch fish like that. Your bonus silvers at the bottom of the slope because they're the they're sort of getting the scraps if you like so that's going to be my cue to move back onto the three foot first go on the three foot i've not had that double on this yet straight in and this is the one i've got to really pay attention to for me me tape so i know that this one i've sat in the exact same position all the time with my right leg touching the leg of my box and i want to get this right in the right place you can see i've left my rig in the water yeah, the last thing I want to do is try and lower it in vertically. So I just want to hold it just like that. And what it'll do is just, just marry up, touch the bank, and in that case, that couldn't be any better. That's pulled me flipping elastic out on the way in. Just as that lovely slow fall. I can't, you can't lift and drop or move your rig. You have to let it fall on a tight line to ensure that it ends up tight so you see the bites. I mean, it's so easy with it being so steep. If I were to mess about my rig, I could easily put line on the bottom and not see any bites happening by just going two or three inches past where I want to be. So just being really disciplined and patient with yourself, keeping everything as tight as possible. I think you can see just by moving rigs that are what? 10 inches apart on the canal, I go from a perch to an F1 in a second. And it's soft in the case that as well, whether it's F1s and carp or flipping silverfish as well. That often the amount of times you find different stamps and different uh, species just lingering at different points of the shelf is incredible. So same again, right on my join. I'm gonna go up to that, so I'm holding it, I'm not lifting that float out. I really wanna get me rigging this, I know, because I need to feed some bait. See, I'm being really stubborn, so as I say, I need that to happen nice and quick. It's ridiculous. This is what I was on about, about feeding on that slope, so they can see your bait. It's just there, it's so easy for them to pick out. So although you don't need the accumulation of feed, your bait's like flipping. It's like a light bulb right at them. It's right where they want to be, where they want to feed. You can see the change is ridiculous. You know what I mean? In both efficiency, size of fish them catching, type of bites, everything just gets a million times better. I think that one's managed to wing himself in. Still ridiculous. And I've got my bait in that time as well. I've fed on the way back to make sure there's some feed in, meaning I can go straight in and nail another one hopefully. That's gonna be my routine now because it is so good. And I need to hold it so tight. I mean, I don't wanna try and feed while, while it's happening. Well, technically I could, I could feed a bit now to be fair. As long as I'm patient and just hold on tight to that. And get some bait in. So on this line, I'm, I'm gonna feed bait over it. Naturally, it's gonna end up on this one and the line further back. And then I'm almost always pushing my pole past my float. Yeah, because the slope's coming this way towards me, I'm always pushing my pole and holding my rig tight. Equally when I'm laying it in again, swing it all the way towards myself. Hold that float lovely, lovely, lovely and tight, tight as I possibly can. Just to ensure it ends up on that tight line. So, and when you miss a bite as well on this line, because it's, you never put it on a flat bottom, you have to relay, relay your whole rig. I mean, there's no lifting and dropping your rig on this, lifting at a bite. It's less okay, so as you strike, you flick it back towards yourself and you let it go back in. And immediately after a couple on this, already I'm feeling that there's potential for that shallow water to start coming into it. Just keep edging it up. So with maggots, it's tr quite tricky because you can't often get maggots to register on your float. I mean, your bristles just aren't delicate enough to do so. Whereas if you're doing that with pellets, it's a lovely way of getting your pellet to sort of overshot your float. So it tells you exactly whether you're in the right place or not. This one's gone a little bit scatty now. Yeah, that's right. So again, I'd persevere on this one for the foreseeable until problems occurred. Yeah, if I start missing bites, I start far looking them, 
I start then it's time to move up or alternatively if you find that your peg starts fizzling and you stop seeing bites or you stop getting bites then the fish aren't ever going to be above where you're feeding if you're not getting indications yeah so that's the time when my peg goes flat and I stop seeing bites on the shallower rigs that's the time to drop down and you can stay in touch with the fish as long as the fish in your peg you can literally stay in touch with them all day long by going up and down that slope proper edit that one so that one's had it on the slack line i've not seen that so we're gonna have one quick go now right at top of the slope just see what's happening up there then so the top of the slope is where I'm always looking to potentially catch a load. If I can get them on top of the slope, I can make a mess. Whereas the other ones, they're lovely, steady. I can catch nicely all day on them, but I can't empty it. I mean, it's not where I'm going to catch a big weight really, really quickly. Whereas if they rock up in that really shallow water, then both the liners are massively reduced because the fish can't get behind me bait. And they really, really start competing for it. What I'm going to do is just before I get in, I'm going to feed some bait. You can see I'm putting loads of bait on the far bank. I've got no problem with that whatsoever because it means I'm putting it in the right place. Yeah, that's going to trickle down, bounce off. It means I'm not feeding it shorter in my line. All my bait is where I'm going to be fishing pretty much. Yeah, where am I going? I'm going right in there. Just got to be careful of that far bank. You see he's right in the shallowest possible water now. I could do a dot that float down a bit, but I still reckon we'll get one. Saying all that's done within what? Yeah, 18 inches of a pole, if you like. It's crazy. Little indication there. See, I don't think there's many in this. See, it's unbelievable how such little differences in depth, and you can go from a million fish in your peg to no fish because they're just not happy. It takes a little bit longer in the day or amounts of fish in your peg just to make them go up into that shallow water where they're easy to catch. But still, that happened quick enough for me to be happy with no problems. Bigger stamp F1 as well. And a proper bite. I should have had that. That was horrendous netting. They're all like actually fighting a bit now as well. T is beautiful and a little bit bigger than everything else we've been catching as well. So even though he's had it a bit though, it was a bit of a dodgy bite that though. Let me see, I'm going to dot this float down a bit. I'm going to go in again. I've lost me disgorge, where's he gone? Lost him. But in. Oh, he's, he's hiding, he's hiding, we've got him. Thank you. So it is, in today's case, phenomenal because of pleasure fishing. And if I'm completely honest, I don't think we'd have to move out this shallow water. It's where they want to be. So I'm not going to get to show the peg slowing down sort of thing and moving just because there's that many fish. We're on our own, as you'd expect. So instead, what I am going to show is that when you move at the wrong time, the problems that you're faced with. So as I say, I'm sat now in me, what do we say it was? Yeah, 18 inch, two foot in my shallowest line and it's steady. I mean, there's fish there all the time and I'm coming back with 95% of my fish in the mouth. It's efficient as it could, it's as efficient as it could possibly be. Although I've said that on this one cast, it's got a bit quiet. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna catch one now. I'm gonna come back with this. I can still see there's indications. There's still plenty of fish in that shallow water. And what I'm gonna do is drop down into the deep water at the wrong time. Do you know what I mean? Which, I'm saying that, I'm saying it's wrong. I believe it's wrong with maggots and with the fish that are feeding today because I know it's in my peg. It's F1s and an odd silver. 
the F1s are clearly in the shallow water, it's where they want to be. However, if I was fishing with pellets or at a different venue maybe, often by dropping down onto this the deeper line, the bottom of the slope now where after what, after an hour's fishing nearly, hopefully some bait starts to accumulate at the bottom of that slope. And if I was fishing pellets, it'd definitely be the case. There'd be a bit of bait starting to build up there. And what you can find is the bigger fish can sometimes sit at the bottom of the slope. Yeah, it's particularly when you're fishing pellets. So not today, I'm not expecting it to happen today. I think today it's going to be a case of demonstrating the wrong place, being clearly in the wrong place in your peg once you've got them fish feeding. So what I'm going to do, as I said, I'm going to whiz me, me deep rig on. That elastic, a bit of a lube. But back onto me deep rig and you'll see that everything will be a bit erratic, I'd imagine. I could be wrong, it could be absolutely lifting and beautiful, but I don't think it will. I think all I'm going to get by fishing on this deeper line is either catch different fish, catch the, the scavengery little silvers that are hanging at the bottom or a little stamp of F1, or I'm going to get indications of foul look lots of fish. So I can go back now to feeding because I can sit it in nice now. You can see that rig sat lovely still, not moving. So I don't think I'm going to have the problems of foul lookers, maybe. Oh, I think that was snagged on something then. Dropping back in, keeping to me tape. I say it looks nothing. It looks like, well, it is. It's flipping two foot shorter. So you feel like you're in the flipping same place. If you were looking down the canal at someone, you barely know that they changed rigs. But the difference, you see just nothing's happening. Yeah, I don't feel like there's any fish almost on that deeper one. It'll only be the odd F1 whizzing through that makes the peg any different. See, it's just sat there so close, two foot away. And that rig is literally just sat there, not moving at all, because the fish, in today's case, they don't want to be in that depth. I mean, it is that time of year when it is a massive thing, when the water's starting to warm up, particularly on days like today when you get a bit of sun. Nothing wants to be in the deeper water. A little bit of a weird indication then, but this has been in 20, 30 seconds now without anything happening, which is, considering the amount of fish that are on that far bank, incredible. They're just little weird indications, all just, uh, none of them are bites. All just little, see little pokey stabs like that. They're literally just fish bashing into me rig. As they're probably passing it, just touching the line as they move to the far bank to pick up that bait that's on the far bank. See, different fish as well. Finally, I do get one. Exactly what I was on about, in this case with maggots. And when F1s are involved, I'm catching the little, uh, I think he was a perch then, little scavengery fish. Yeah, that was either a perch or a foul look gudgeon. But let me have one more go. In fact, I'm going to do two. I'm going to just show you the difference again. I'm going to catch one in this and then I will drop once more again into that deep one just to show you that it's not a little quiet spell or anything. Just the difference in being in the wrong depth, even in such a tight location, is quite simply frightening. And it's all about staying in touch. I mean, things are happening and you're catching at a, a rate that you think is right for the day, right for the venue, right for the lake, whatever. Then you don't need to come off it. You just have to read the signs that tell you when to come off it. So in this case, same again. Going in, odd little blink, which is, I believe, odd little liners. But no, nice positive bite. So same again, different fish. Another perch. Is he a perch? Oh, I don't know. He might be a skin bob, this one. But the scavengery, the wrong fish again. None of them big pound and a half F1s that were catching two foot away. What's he? I can't even see him. He's a little diddy carp, little baby carp. But what I'm going to do now, just to show you, last demonstration -y bit, is I'm going to whiz over to that shallow water now. And you can determine just how quickly, or see just how quickly, it's obvious when you're in the right place and little decisions like that, just having a little go to find out what's going on, potentially can be massively detrimental. I mean, you need to stick to what the fish are telling you. If you're catching the right fish in the right depth without problems, you don't want to swap about too much from that and just see, because the time that you cost yourself or the weight that you cost yourself can be massive. I mean, those two casts that I've just had, I didn't catch a fish and then I caught one 10 ounce. That could have been three pound if I'd have fished in the right depth across. 
being a bit more patient, waiting for a proper bite, like that. And it's absolutely ridiculous. So I'm going to nail this one. And I think we do need to be a little bit technical. So what I'll do, I'll just run through the exact type of rigs we use, for, in particularly for maggots, for today, how we've done things. Another little one, but bites are coming nice and quick across. So with that one, what we'll babble is have a quick look at the rigs that I'm using, just in depth, just so you can see exactly what we're doing, because people like a bit of that before we wrap up. So straight away, what should we start with? Should we do back to front? Yeah, let's do back to front. So like I said, I've slowly touched on this before. Yeah, if I was going to fish pellets, everything would be tighter. We've gone through that video a million times before. Hard pellet or soft pellet, accurate fishing. It's all about keeping things as stable as possible most of the time. And because of that, the shot will be a lot tighter. For maggots, however, there is that percentage of fish that I'm going to catch through the water. I mean, it's a bait that takes three and a half months to hit the bottom in five foot. So definitely I need a rig that can potentially make my rig look a bait look a little bit nicer, a bit more natural. And it does have a slightly, just slightly less bulk effect. I mean, it sinks a bit nicer than a, um, a pellet rig would. So what I'll run through is each one individually today, perfect elastic in the world, although I wish I'd use short kits. Yeah, they're pulling a little bit harder today, so I wish I had a, a shorter length of elastic could be a bit better in this situation, but our green stuff, absolutely spot on. When I'm catching a mix of species with maggots at this time of year, absolutely spot on, even if I'm catching predominantly silvers. Do you know what I mean? Uh, 8 to 10, 1.4 slick, absolutely bang on. As I said, today I'd rather have had them in a short kit, just so I can get them under control a little bit. And for the deep one, really, really simple, I'm on our... Brand new sexy floats that you lot will be seeing very soon. In that case, all of them are carbon stem. Again, that's, other than my soft pellet fishing that's done only in the winter for skimmers and rock bottom, I find for 95% of my fishing now, it's carbon stems just because of the less aggro it causes. I mean, less wrap overs, more durability. Just carbon makes things easy, doesn't it? In today's case, they've got decent bristles on. They've all got 1.5 mil hollow bristles. I can see them nice. The bites are good enough this time of year now that I don't need that extra finesse of delicate bristles. It's just a bit more robust. So all, all nice. I've got 016 mainline on, 016.5 mil mainline. As you can see, we're shotting on them. It's that taper that we're on about all the time. I'm a big, big fan of that. Slightly tapered style rig. So in the bottom 18 inches, I've literally got a spread of seven number 10s, eight number 10s, one, two, three, four, yeah, eight number 10 spread out nicely in a taper, starting just on top of my four inch chuck length. Yeah, probably three inches between the first, two inches, two inches, two inches, one inch, one inch, 10 mil. Yeah, just that taper that I'm on about that just gives it a nice, goes in nice while still registering bites really, really quick because I've got my first number 10 on the loop of my hook length. I mean, I've mentioned that loads as well. Big fan of putting a number 10 just on my hook length loops, just straighten things out. I mean, it either closes my hook length loop up to make a nice tight connection or it straightens them loops themselves if they're kicking off a bit that'll depend where i put it 010 hook lengths absolutely spot on for this i'm not going to hook anything too big and in that case with the hook i've got a weird hook on them all i can't go into hooks with you like that's a sample hook that i'm using a nice light gauge hook brilliant for me wintry f1s and me silver as well and in that case i've got an 18 on i mean just right for a big fat lane's bait maggot so that was me 414's rig that's me deep one or me 0.3 rig in um, 0.4 rig sorry That'd be a 414s in old money. Then the next one, three foot, floats are really simple. I've literally gone the same float on all of them, a slim carbon stem, I said 1.5 mil bristle. Um, I've gone 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. I mean, really, really simple. What depth are we gonna say? Yeah, for every foot and a half, 0 0.1 of a gram, isn't it? So I've got point, yeah, 0 0.2 in 18 inch, I've got 0 0.3 in three foot, 0.4 and 4.5 and foot, about right. You know, it gives me enough shot to create a nice slow fall. You see with this one, slightly more of a taper on that one. Same again, that one's there. I'm not going to call it a 4.12, I'm going to call it a 0.3. Exactly the same. You know I mean, nothing's any different. Two inches, two inches, two inches, two inches, an inch. It just keeps things nice. You know what I mean? It's still big enough shot that shows you what's going on while still creating a nice sexy fall. And the last one, same again, a little bit more condensed. I mean, no taper on this one, just really, really basic. One number 10 on my hook length, two number 10s above it. Nothing fancy. On all my floats, I've got a few fine tuners. I mean, you've seen me do that a million times over the years. That's just for marking me depth and getting me bristle right. But really, really, really basic. But the main thing, the emphasis today is definitely what you have to take. The two main things, in fact, if anything, is that plumbing up. 
just not being scared to actually poke a, poke a rig into a gradient, have a look at what you think the gradient is once you've plumbed your different rigs, and it gives you a, you just get an idea of whether bait can sit on it or not. I mean, just by having a look at it, like we did with the dodgy landing net, just gives you a, a really good idea of whether your bait can stick on it. But then after that, it's understanding what the fish are doing. Yeah, they show you really, really clearly whether they're on a line, not happy in that depth, or whatever else. They tell you where you need to be so clearly when you're fishing in that way. All you have to do is fish it a few times, get a bit of experience to it, and it's really, really easy to keep in touch with whatever them fish want to do on a day. So hopefully you enjoyed that one. It has been absolutely lovely to sit here in a bit of warmth and catch an utter boatload of fish. And if you liked it, feel free, click on that button, like and subscribe, and myself and all the other Comatrix consultants, as always, will try and bring you the best content and the most instructional content we possibly can. So I hope you enjoyed that, and we'll see you all very, very soon.